Uh, open up your Bibles today to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 958. Uh, or if you are technologically inclined, uh, the notes are also in the Version Bible app under the live event section. Uh, you can tap on that and find all the notes uh, and scripture there for you. Uh, some years ago, uh, just about 60 years ago, actually, there were a couple of brothers in college. And uh, as many people in college, they began to dream about what they were going to do after college. And they had all kinds of thoughts and, and all kinds of desires and want-tos and, and uh, uh, plans. And uh, they were scheming and, and making these plans. And uh, in, the, in among those plans, these two brothers had a friend who was a real estate agent who was trying to sell a bar. And he mentioned this to these two brothers, and they said, you know, what? I, I, well, maybe we should buy that thing and go into uh, some sort of business in that capacity and, and make some money. Uh, and so they went and they asked their mother for a loan to help them purchase this uh, place so they could uh, begin to uh, work it. And uh, she gave them $600 to go and do whatever they wanted to do. And so they went, and they were, were on the way and thinking about what they were going to do with this facility. And the real estate agent, their friend, uh, began to tell him, you know what, guys, um, I don't know if alcohol is, is what you need to be doing. He said, what, as college kids, what do you all spend a lot of time uh, as far as, as food? What do you all spend a lot of time thinking about and consuming? And naturally, they said, well, pizza. Uh, and so they said, you know, maybe we should, instead of opening a, a, a bar, we should uh, open a pizza place. And so they began to process this. And they ended up purchasing that place for $600. And... Um, or, or uh, fronting a few months uh, rent for $600, and they turned it into a pizza place. And it did all right. It didn't, you know, do fantastic. It did enough to continue operating the place and enough also for them to open up a second location a year later. Uh, and so they are operating these two places, and they're still doing okay. They're just not doing great. And they begin to think about this. How can we do what we do better? How can we get pizza in the hands of more people? Uh, and a thought occurred to them of a guy sitting at home and thinking, you know, I, what I really want for dinner is some pizza, but it's all the way over there. I don't want to drive over there to get it. And one of the brothers had the thought, well, you know what we should do? We should take the pizza to them. And these two brothers began to mull that over and the whole process of, of delivering pizza, it didn't, hadn't been done before. And so they said, you know what, we should do it. We should just do it and uh, work it out after we just step out and do this thing. And so they began to advertise pizza delivery and their business exploded like gangbusters where then uh, uh, they had two locations. 18 years later, they had 4,000 locations just in America and they sold their business uh, to Pepsi for $300 million in 1977. Today's money, $1.2 billion. Two college kids with an idea. Uh, that company's called Pizza Hut. You may have heard about it. Uh, and they, they went off on this, and uh, just as an aside, a piece of irony, one of the brothers is now a major franchise owner in Papa John's. I don't know what that says about anything, but that's just the way it is. Uh, and so they had this idea that really took off, this pizza delivery thing. Uh, simply because they wanted to remove any obstacle in their consumer's way in order to get pizza in as many mouths as possible. And now what we're going to see here today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is something very similar. Paul, the author of this letter uh, to the church in Corinth, trying to remove any obstacle from getting the gospel into as many hands as possible. So as we looked last week in Corinthians, Paul founded this church here in this city. Uh, he had gone to the city of Corinth, began to tell people about Jesus. So many people were getting saved. They started a church there, uh, and uh, uh, Paul spent a year and a half uh, working there and telling more people about Jesus and getting this thing off the ground. And these letters we have here in, in the Bible, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, are letters he wrote back to that church he founded years later in response to some issues that were going on in that church and some questions that they themselves had about certain things. And so we get here in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to start down in verse 23. Uh, and Paul is going to bring up something uh, that they might would prefer him not to do. Starting in verse 23, 
of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Now that little phrase, all things are lawful, that's a phrase he's used before back in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, it was a common phrase of the day, particularly in the city of Corinth. Uh, they would use this all the time. It was uh, just something they would throw out, a, 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 a societal phrase. All things are lawful. I can do whatever I want. You can't tell me what to do. They can't tell me what to do. All things are lawful for me, Roman citizen living in Corinth. And so Paul brings up this common phrase they're using. And he says, you say all things are lawful. Okay, fine. But not all things are helpful. You say all things are lawful, but not all things build up. Uh, you see, what was happening is some of these these Christians in this church were using this common phrase of the day uh, as justification for doing a variety of things in their lives. They were saying, not only are all things lawful for me as a Roman citizen living in Corinth, all things are lawful for me as a Christian. I am free in Christ to do whatever I want. I'm saved, I'm good, I'm covered, I'm going to heaven, so all things are lawful for me. And Paul says, okay, you say that, but all the things you're doing, some of them are not so helpful, not just to you, to your family, to, to your city, uh, but to the body of Christ. And is it, then he says, you know, not all things build up, not all things edify, not all things encourage, and yet you're still doing them. He's, he's kind of instructing them, what you need to do is you need to have a, a choice construction process. You need to be very selective in how you're constructing and how you're building up. And not be doing everything under the sun, but be doing things that build up, having a choice construction. Because you're supposed to be building a better body. You're supposed to be constructing for the cause of Christ, not for your own selfish benefit. You know, in actuality, where they say, all things, all things are lawful, Paul is trying to get them to understand, you know, you are free to do anything in the world short of sin. You're not free to sin. You're not free to run about and do whatever you want. Even though you are covered under grace, you are covered under Christ's blood, you are going to heaven. But you're not free to run around sinning. That doesn't build up. That doesn't encourage. That doesn't uh, help anyone. You see, these what Paul is doing here in this verse and in the next couple verses is he is beginning to lay the groundwork for an argument that he is going to unfold for the rest of this chapter. Here, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Uh, look at verse 24. He says, Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So he says, you know, you may be thinking all things are lawful, I can do whatever I want. Well, you shouldn't be focused on yourself. You shouldn't be focused on you and what makes you better. We hinted on it a little bit last week. The attitude in Corinth, uh, last week we talked about money a little bit. The attitude in Corinth was, I work hard for my money. It's mine. I'm not giving it to anybody that I don't have to. I'm not giving it to my neighbor if they need it. I'm not giving it to the church. It's my money. No one else can benefit from it except me. And Paul's saying, you're not supposed to be looking out for you. Jesus told us uh, in, in Matthew chapter 6 that God is going to take care of us. God is going to provide for us. He's the one looking out for us. We should be looking out for others. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. And then Paul seems to take a sharp left turn. Verse 25. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising question on the ground of conscience. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market. I don't know if y'all have ever been to some questionable meat markets. Um, I went on a mission trip to Mexico one time. Uh, very interesting things you see in the meat market. Uh, I, I, I vividly remember a story my dad told me. One time he went, had to go to the store. It was sent to the store uh, by my grandmother to get something. And uh, the only store open on that particular holiday was the Chinese grocery store. And he went in there to purchase something, and he saw some very interesting things hanging in the meat market in the back of the store. Uh, but when Paul is saying the meat market here, uh, this would resonate with the Jews in the church. This church in Corinth is made up of people from a cultural Jewish background and people from a cultural Gentile Greek background. And so he says, you go to the meat market, you don't have to worry, raise any questions about where any of it came from. Because what the Jews would do, because of their cultural meat restrictions, is they would go to the meat market and they would ask a, a litany of questions about where the meat came from. 
Where was, was the animal raised? Uh, what, what food did the animal eat? Um, who, what, what shepherd took care of this animal? Uh, what, how was the animal slaughtered? In what process? How long did it take? Uh, how was the, the meat prepared to bring it here? And they would go through all these questions, along with the myriad of others, trying to figure out exactly uh, the story behind the meat hanging there. And uh, Paul, because they wanted to fulfill their cultural uh, restrictions and laws about consuming meat. And Paul is telling them, you go to the meat market, don't worry about asking any questions about where it came from. That, that doesn't matter. Now remember, the first couple of verses that we've just been talking about have nothing to do with meat and what Paul's talking about. But what he did in those first two verses is kind of give us a glimpse. That's his thesis statement. Give us a glimpse of where he's headed later on. And so now he's beginning this argument with eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising question on the ground of conscience. Look at verse 26. He says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of Thereof, He says you can go to the meat market, you can get whatever you want, because everything in the earth, all the meat, all the animals, it has all been created by God. You can eat your bacon if you want to eat your bacon. In moderation, of course. You can, you can eat all of those things and not worry about it. Because uh, uh, God, uh, back in the book of Acts and speaking to Peter, says there's no more restrictions on any of those things. You can eat whatever you want, just as you can tell anybody about Jesus that you want. It's all free for you to consume. Peter told the church that. Paul told the church that. You're not limited by those things. <clears throat> and so he's trying to express this to the readers of this book. Verse 27, he continues. If one of the unbelievers, now that's going to be key in just a moment, in just a moment. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, Eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So he says, you know, as, as often happens today, as then, uh, they were invited to dinner by all kinds of people. In that particular society, uh, dinner was an intimate thing, but it was also an, a, a chance to network. It was a chance to, to climb the social ladder. And so they went out to eat at, at other people's houses all the time. And so Paul says, if an unbeliever invites you to their house, you don't have to worry about the food they're going to set before you, about whether it fulfills your, your dietary restrictions culturally. If they set it before you, he says, eat it. It's okay to eat it. If it's got mold on it, that's a different issue. But if it's just meat that's been set there and properly prepared, you can eat it. No big deal. You see, it's because he's saying for the Christian, uh, there are no cultural restrictions. Cultural restrictions have no hold on the Christian. And so Paul is trying to communicate this, trying to get the people to understand you have great freedom in Christ. He doesn't restrict you. There is no law under uh, uh, Christ that says you cannot eat certain things. However, this unbeliever invites you, you eat it. Verse 28, he says, but... But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. Now what would often happen is in that society there were all kinds of fake gods, all kinds of, of uh, 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 idols that people would worship. And uh, some of the things they would do is they would buy this meat, they would... Uh, sacrifice it to their idol and uh, some of them would then go and sell it in the meat market some of them would take it home and eat it and even some of them would take it home and eat it as a form of worship and so what P Paul is saying now if you go to this house and uh, this meat is set before you you're okay to eat it unless somebody at the meal says you know what that's been sacrificed to an idol now, Paul seems to contradict himself. I mean, if you really think about it, he has just told us if the guy sets the meat before you, it's okay to eat. Unless somebody tells you that it came from an idol, then it's not okay to eat. And so we're thinking, hold up, Paul. You know, you just told me it was okay. Everything's okay to eat. It's all good. Now you're telling me that simply having new knowledge about the source of the meat limits my ability to consume it. That doesn't really compute. Why not just correct the guy and say, you know, those dietary restrictions don't apply to me. I can eat whatever I want. Why not just tell him uh, uh, that that is no big deal anymore under Christ? Well, it comes down to the fact of what Paul says there. 
do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. You see, even if you explain yourself and say, this doesn't apply, this is not, not, not an issue for me anymore, uh, there is still something in that person seeing you eat it. This unbeliever who very well likely was an idol worshiper seeing the Christian eat the meat. In effect, endorsing his lifestyle. And so Paul is saying, even though you are free to eat the meat, it's your right, you're okay to do it. But for the sake of that person's conscience, for the sake of that person's eternal soul, don't. Because his, his, his eternity is worth more than your taste buds. That's where it's at. And now Paul is going to continue on in this. You know, he says, he ends that with, for the sake of conscience, don't eat it. Verse 29, he says, I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Our freedom isn't limited by what someone else feels, but there's a deeper issue. Verse 30. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Now, that's an odd way to phrase it, but basically what he's saying is the meal is set before you. You thank God for the meal. You're thankful for what God has provided in this meal. But then this other unbeliever or, or weaker believer says, you know, where that actually came from is from a sacrifice for an idol. And then if you go ahead and consume the meal, because it's your right to do so in your freedom in Christ, if you consume it, this other unbeliever or, or weaker believer will denounce you, will condemn you, will, will think less of you because of what you have just done. You will either have harmed this person's opportunity to know Christ or you will have weakened their journey in growing closer to Christ. Even though it's your right to do it, there is something better, something more helpful, a different opportunity. What we should be doing is, you know, that dinner is our right, that is our, our, our freedom to do so, but we've got to denounce our dinner before someone uses our dinner to denounce the divine. We've got to denounce our rights, denounce our freedom, if it risks someone else's opportunity for eternity. Denounce your dinner before someone uses your dinner to denounce the divine. And that's a hard thing to really kind of digest there as we begin to think about, it's my right to do this. I, I deserve this, uh, you know, just because they don't understand and, and they're weaker and there's something wrong with them. That shouldn't limit me. I can do whatever I want because I'm free in Christ. And that's not a sin for me. That's not a conviction of mine. I'm okay. I can, I can walk down this path and be totally okay. But what Paul is beginning to explain is that there is something more important than our own individual rights. There is something more important than what, what I think I deserve in the moment. And it comes down to this, verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So he's just been talking about a dinner and a meal, whatever you do. Whatever you do, whatever it is, you, you're eating in this particular context, you're drinking, uh, whatever you do in your entire capacity, do it all to the glory of God. Now, if you were to examine your life, okay, take yesterday, from the moment you woke up to the moment you fell asleep last night, can you say with absolute certainty that that verse is true of you? Whatever you did yesterday you did for the glory of God. In your waking up, in, in your response to certain people, in the way you spoke, in your thought process about other issues, uh, when you saw the news, was, was your response in your heart uh, uh, bringing glory to God? As you maybe watched those football games yesterday afternoon, was your response uh, glorifying to God? As you went to bed last night and thinking about today, was your response glorifying to God? When you woke up this morning and realized that it is 20-something degrees outside, uh, and was your response glorifying to God? Or were you hit with a shock when you let the dog out this morning, as I was? Uh, what was your response to God? Were you glorifying Him in whatever you did and whatever you said and whatever you thought he says, whatever you do, glorify God. Now that is really hard to really kind of try to wrap our head around. Everything. 
Not just a little bit, not just when we think about it, not just when it crosses our minds or when we see our Bible sitting over on the corner. I mean, not just every once in a while. It's everything we do. Does it bring glory to God? Because what Paul's saying here is, you know, a lot of times we think about food and we think about food glorifying us. I want food. Food. I like food. It makes me happy. Uh, give me a good basket of rolls, a good uh, plate of meat, and some ice cream, and I'm happy. I'll be your best friend, (laughs) okay? I'm coming to lunch. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Uh, But what Paul is saying is it's not about that. It's not about making you happy with what you're eating. It's about in your eating, are you glorifying God for the other person who's sitting at the table? Or let's make it a modern context. You go to eat lunch today, out to eat. Your waiter is there coming back and forth. Maybe they don't give you the best service. They don't keep your water glass filled. Does your response in the tip reflect the quality of service or glory to God? What's more important, the potential uh, e- eternal ramifications for the waiter or the extra two bucks you could have put on the table? Did you mention Jesus to the waiter? Or did you just let the opportunity slip by? What is more important in that moment? And Paul is really trying to shift the focus of these Corinthians to see eternity is always more important. Look at verse 32. He says, now as we read verse 32, I want you to try to swallow this one down. He says, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Remember, in that church, they've got Jews and they've got Greeks. Two vastly different cultures. Uh, uh, you know, uh, their traditions, the, the things that they think are okay, uh, are, are very different. And he says, don't offend any of them. In what you do, in, in thinking about eternity and how, how your, your actions can benefit their eternity and their relationship with God, do your best not to offend them. Don't offend the Jews, don't offend the Greeks. And then he says, don't offend the church of God. Don't let anything you do be an embarrassment to what God has purposed for his church. Don't offend it whatsoever. And now that is a hard thing to really think about, how in any action we do, trying not to offend somebody. Because particularly in today's culture, uh, we are very offense sensitive. We get offended at a lot of things. We get offended uh, just as a culture, maybe not you individually, maybe nothing offends you. Uh, if, if that's the case, come and talk to me. Let, let me try to offend you. Uh, but Paul is saying, try not to offend anybody for the sake of eternity, for the sake of the gospel, because that's more important than you giving your opinion. That's more important than, than you expressing something that has potential to offend the other person sitting across the table from you. Their eternity is more important than that. Verse 33, do that just as I try to please everyone. Paul's trying to be a people pleaser. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So he says, I try to please everyone in everything I do. Not seeking my own advantage because the advantage is for the unbeliever. The advantage is for the weaker Christian. He's constantly thinking about how he can better their relationship with God, how he can introduce them to Christ, and how his example could potentially damage what God has for them in their lives. How, you know, every one of us, whether we like it or not or believe it or not, are being watched by someone. They're watching our responses, they're watching our actions, they're watching our words, what we say. Whether we have kids in the house and they imitate us and they say what we say, or just in the church, other people in the church are watching you. Particularly if you are a more seasoned believer and have been a believer for years and they see your response saying, me, 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 gimme, 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 I want, I want, it's my right to have this, it's my right to do this. Paul's saying, no. In in, in seeking to assert your assumed rights, you're damaging the potential for the other weaker brother. The other weaker believer. You say, we need to surrender our rights. We need to, to let it go. Surrendering our rights for the salvation of others, just as Jesus did, and as Paul says here, he's doing. How many of you would like to tell people, imitate me, follow my example to the T, because I am following Christ's example? 
Not me. That is a hard thing to say to anyone. Come examine my life, everything I'm doing. Do what I do because I am typifying what you should be doing in following Christ. But Paul is saying that. He's saying, you've, you've eaten with me. You've seen me. We've been together a year and a half. Follow my example. You've seen the way I responded. And I've been trying to respond in the way Christ has every single time. That many may be saved. I think that's key, too. He's not saying he's doing this, uh, you know, so a, small, he, so a small amount, although he would still do it if a small amount simply came to Christ. He is doing what he is doing, changing his entire life, turning it on its head for the very sake that many might come to know Christ. The opportunity, the potential is there if he would simply surrender his rights. And these Corinthians would do the same. There's something more important than, than, than him getting his way or me getting my way. Now, I've got these tables up here. How many of you at holidays, whether when you were a kid or today, uh, when you would go eat at uh, somebody's house for that particular occasion, you had the adult table and you had the kiddie table? Anybody had that when you were growing up or had it today? Had it a few weeks ago. The adult table and the kiddie table. Well, I'll tell you, at my grandmother's house growing up, the way it worked obviously was all the adults were at the adult table and all the kids were in a different room at the kiddie table. I mean, the noise was crazy. Uh, uh, my parents, we, we were th- had three kids. It was me and two siblings. And uh, my aunt, um, I'm trying to remember back then how many kids she had. I think she had six in the occasion I'm thinking of. Uh, she since adopted another one. Um, but so all the kids, you can imagine that many kids, cousins, it was loud. We're all shoved in the other room at the kiddie table, and all the adults are at the, at the big table sitting there with, with the, the table laid out with all kinds of good food. And there's a lot of good food. I'm just, let me tell you, it, it, she always had ham. That was what she, she would put turkey for everybody else, but she wanted ham, so they always had ham at her house. Uh, there would be a big bowl of macaroni and cheese, two on the adult table, on either end of the table that had just been pulled out of the oven. The cheese was, is, is drizzling down the outside of the, the bowl. There's so much of it. Um, uh, the thing, though, that got me, all right, and, I, and once I finally graduated to the adult table, which I did not do till I got married, uh, it, it's really hard being 20 years old sitting at the kiddie table with the 10-year-olds, but that's, what, that's the way it worked out. Uh, but at the, 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 I would situate myself in this particular spot for this reason. Because at the adult table, there was the basket of rolls. And uh, my, at, at all these family gatherings, my mom would make what she called special occasion rolls. Um, mm, I may have to make some this afternoon. I'm not even joking. They are good. I mean, you take a bite, and it's just the bread just melts in your mouth. You know, it, oh, man. Anyway, uh, well, they, they would have a basket of rolls on the table. And halfway through the meal, all right, mom would go get up and pull out a second batch of rolls fresh out of the oven and dump them on the top of that basket. And you didn't know that the hot rolls were ready unless you were sitting at the adult table. And so the way it would work is the kids would, before the meal started, before we prayed, all the kids would have to come in with their plates to the adult table uh, and beg for food, or, so to speak. They would, they would get, you know, slops of everything on their plate. They'd get a slice of ham. They'd get one of those rolls. They'd have to go, we'd have to go back in the other room, set it on the table, and then come back to where the adults were to pray. Uh, but while we're standing there praying, all of their food is still hot. The rolls are sitting on a hot plate on the table. Uh, the ham is on a everything is on a hot plate to keep warm, except on the kitty table where all our food is getting cold in the other room, uh, which we were from Texas, so the AC was always on, so the AC is blowing on our food. And so we go back in here to pray, and we're standing over their, their steaming food, and we pray, and we go back in there to our food, and it's all ice cold. You know, it, it, is, it is, I mean, I still ate the bread, don't get me wrong, but it was, it was cold. But the adults, they got to consume the good stuff. They got to have the good stuff. But the kids in here at the kiddie table, we'd pull up our chair to that kiddie table, and we would say, uh, we'd finish our food, and um, this is exactly how it was for me growing up. 
uh, we would sit there at the kiddie table. I've, I've, I've been this height since second grade. Anyway, uh, we'd sit there at the kiddie table, and we want more. We would want more macaroni. We'd want the, the hot macaroni. And the thing was, you couldn't, as a kid at, at my grandmother's house, simply get up and walk into the adult table room. You had to let them know you were coming to get food because they're not about to give you the good food. Uh, that's making my family sound really mean, but that's the way it worked. Food is very important. Uh, and so we sit there. And at the kitty table, you begin to yell, I want macaroni, I want bread, I want uh, uh, more of this or more of that. And they would say, no, you got to eat your peas before you can come back in here and get more bread. I don't want peas, I want bread. Now, I'm going to pretend like I'm five years old when I'm saying this, okay? Uh, I'm not 20 years old sitting at the kitty table yelling for bread. That's just not the way it worked out. But anyway, they would be saying, eat your peas before you can come back in here. And I'm saying, I don't want my peas. I want my bread. My mom made that bread. It's my right to put the bread in my mouth, and, and I'm going to eat it. And, uh, and, of course, my grandmother's in there begging for them to give me bread. That's the way it works. Grandmothers beg for the grandkids to get the good stuff. But, um, but sometimes we, as, as, as mature Christians... You know, we've got our mature Christian chair, and there's the adult table that God has laid out with all kinds of good things, all kinds of great things that can, that can really enable our spiritual growth. But then we pull up our mature Christian chair to the kiddie table, and we say, I want this, I want that, it's my right to have this, I don't care what you think about whatever, it's my right. And we're sitting there at, at, at the... Uh, the immature table, the kiddie table, saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And God says, no, you're missing it. you got to pull your chair up to the adult table where the good stuff is. Get belly up over here and eat the good stuff. But that means leaving behind some of your rights. That means, that means humbling yourself and saying, maybe it's not all about me. Maybe I need to give up that stuff that I'm saying, it's mine, I deserve it, I have earned this right in, in Christ, I have the freedom to do whatever I want to do. I can eat whatever I want, drink whatever I want, watch at the movies whatever I want, watch on TV whatever I want. I can say whatever word pops out of my mouth. It doesn't matter. I'm forgiven in Christ. I'm good. But I can do whatever I want because I am forgiven. And what Paul is telling us is, no, that's not it at all. The other people who are at the table, their spiritual growth is it less important than yours? Is it just as someone has invested in you at some point in the past? It is our job, it is our responsibility to surrender our rights in favor of somebody else's growth. Maybe that's somebody else's introduction to Christ, or maybe that is a, a weaker believer and them growing in Christ. And that means we've got to give it up. We've got to denounce our dinner before they denounce the divine. We've got to surrender what we think we, we have earned the right to do such and such. We need to stop sitting at the kiddie table with the cold food, belly up to the big table with the good food. And God will bless and God will provide and God will help you grow just as much as he helps those others grow. But we've got to give it up. We've got to surrender it. Because there's, there's more important things than me getting my way. We should do anything short of sin in order to save some. Anything short of sin. And if that means I, I don't eat something in particular, if that means I don't drink something in particular, if that means I don't go see that or go do that or go say that or even go think that, then I need to stop it. Because that person's that other person's spiritual maturity, that other person's introduction to Christ is worth far more than me spouting off my opinion about such and such. Eternity is worth more than the immediate, right now, my rights. We've got to surrender it. You know, and if, and if you are here right now in this room and you haven't even been invited to the table yet because you don't know Jesus, then it's your opportunity right now. You know, Jesus came to this earth because he, he loved humanity so much to not leave it where it was. It's the same with you. He loves you just as you are in your particular situation too much to leave you there. And so he came here and he died and he rose from the dead so that all of your sins would be forgiven by God. Perfect God. All would be forgiven. 
And you could step into heaven, step into a relationship with God, and not have to worry about anything else. No pain and punishment for you, because you know the Creator. But you've got to believe that first and foremost. You've got to know Jesus to get the ticket to heaven. You've got to know Jesus to get the invitation to the dinner. And so if you don't know him, now is your opportunity. Don't wait till this afternoon. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it now. In just a minute when I pray and I say amen, come and, and talk to us and pray. We'll celebrate with you. Just as scripture says, uh, there's a celebration in heaven for every lost sheep that comes to the shepherd. Come to Jesus today. But if you are a believer and in your individual situation, you have a certain certain issue, a certain thing that you're holding on to and say, this is mine and I am not letting go. It is my right to have this. I, I deserve it. I have earned it. I am going to, to, to take part in this. And you're bellied up to the kitty table. Allow God to move your chair to the adult table. Letting go of your rights. Letting go of what, what you think you deserve. Letting go of that because the salvation of the other person is worth more than what you think your rights are. The salvation, let me... The salvation of the, maybe the person on the other end of the phone is worth more than your internet speed. The salvation of the person you have in contact at Walmart is worth more than the way you're feeling in the moment. The spiritual growth of the other person in church is worth more than you expressing your anger about any particular issue. Because eternity is worth more than the moment.